Caught in a web of lies, I never imagined my own home would become the battleground of betrayal. Letty, the woman I loved, had her secrets, and they involved another man, Teague. It was a simple bet that unraveled everything, a gamble on love where I was the unwitting stake. Now, as the pieces fall into place, I'm on a quest not just for truth, but for vengeance. This is my story. Enjoy watching it. My wife, Letty, was confined in the kitchen, sitting in a chair. She appeared to be experiencing the same emotions I was. I felt sorry that I had to lock her up. She attempted to flee and I overreacted. The keys are hidden and not within reach. For the time being, I'm at peace with my decision. Her beautiful makeup has been wrecked by tears. A vomit stain covers the left breast of her small black dress as she stands near the sink. When Letty saw that I had arrived home early, I could smell partially digested wine and bile. She was so astonished and upset that she hurried to the toilet to vomit. It did not come out so great. My wife was busy throwing up her lunch, and I was astonished and heartbroken. She supposedly left for a trade convention in Atlanta that morning and was not scheduled to return until late Sunday evening. She kissed me farewell at 7 a.m. and left for Atlanta mid-morning, a four-hour drive. A semi-trailer trying to make a quick curve collided with an electricity pole outside my store, knocking it over. This resulted in a power outage. My cinder block gun shop purposefully has no windows, and it was quite hot that day. For an hour, we were all sweating in the dark, and my staff were shouting for hazard pay. They were obviously joking, but only half joking. We were still waiting for the co-op's electrician crew when Letty called me in her cheery singing tone, saying, Hello, darling. I arrived in Atlanta at the same hotel where I had been previously. I share a room with one of the girls enrolled under her name. I'm currently in the convention center. We're getting the stand in order. We open at 2 p.m. After that, do not call me. I won't be able to respond. I'll contact you every evening when I'm free to go to supper. Oops, time to go, sweetheart. A few minutes later, a team of electric cooperative employees came. Shortly after, the crew chief came into my store and informed me that they had delivered the incorrect size pole and that it would be another three hours before power was restored. I closed the store and gave everyone Friday off, and I headed straight home, fantasizing of a long, refreshing shower. Imagine my surprise when I came into the bedroom and saw Letty standing beside the bed. She is dressed in a costly lingerie set that I purchased for her during our honeymoon at a high-end store. It included a full-cup bra, garters, and a satin thong in dark red. Since I gave it to her seven years ago, my wife has only worn it a few times. My wife didn't notice me coming in because she was pulling her tight little black dress over her breast, which covered her head. Letty appeared wobbly on her feet. I have a sensitive nose, and I could smell alcohol and excitement on the dresser behind her. I found an open bottle of Chardonnay adjacent in a little puddle of spilled wine. There was a glass with a sip or two remaining. I assumed there was one glass left in the bottle of wine for spirits. This suggested that she consumed at least three glasses, which was excessive for her. She certainly gets excited when Letty does, and her aroma reminds me of peach pie. Warm from the oven, the fragrance invaded my nostrils. I recognized instantly that my wife was tipsy, horny, and dressed in her clothes. I was immediately excited at the prospect of having an extraordinary evening, but it lasted only a second when I remembered that Letty should be in Atlanta right now. I quickly recognized she was preparing to wear her attire for someone else, for someone in the region. When her dress came down to reveal her face, her reaction to me was unforgettable. My young wife cleared her throat, apologizing. Then he started coughing and dashed to the restroom. Watching Letty throw up the majority of the bottle of Chardonnay as well as the remainder of her lunch ruled out the notion that she had planned a special surprise for me. Even as my heart sunk and my universe crumbled, I couldn't tear my gaze away from her elegant shape in a tight dress as she vomited. Her form is really appealing. I'm sure Bodine Teague found her figure appealing. Teague serves as the company's frostbitten marketing director. Letty works for an auto parts manufacturing. When a few attractive women dressed in nice jeans and tight blouses visit a trade show exhibit, the booth's traffic increases fivefold and more orders come in. Thus, Letty entered his field of vision a few years ago. Teague drove a van full of women doing intimate dances to work at an exhibition booth, referring to them as booth candy, 
when employees of the company's human resources, and when legal departments found out about this, there was an explosion similar to the movie breakdown in Grand Theft Auto V. Mr. Cup, the owner of every part, is shamefully lenient with Tig, but even he cannot ignore such a transgression. Mr. Cope now requires Teague to only have full-time staff at the stand. As a result, Teague recruits suites for the stand from among the available office workers. He asks Letty and half a dozen more slim and attractive women to fill the exhibition stand. He agreed with Mr. Cope to refer to his recruits as volunteers and covertly pay them $1,000 in cash for each day of work. No one will complain to management about wearing a tight blouse when they are paid $1,000 a day in tax-free cash for talking to people at her main job. Letty is an accountant, and an excellent one at that. The irony is that she had to labor in the office for nearly a month to make the same amount as she did in one weekend at the show. A fascinating example of the law of supply and demand. I hated that Letty had to work at all, but we needed her money to make ends meet. P.A., my father was a wealthy man when he died last year. P.A. disliked trust money and insisted that his children learn the value of a dollar. He determined that each of his children should start their own businesses and live solely on their earnings until they were 30. Only then are they eligible to receive their part of the family trust. My brother and sister, both a few years older than me, were up to the challenge and told me that the experience would be beneficial. They promised to carry up this practice with their children, the youngest of P.A.'s offspring. I still had two years remaining. Letty and I survived off her wages and what I could bring from my gun business. I get that the phrase, my gun store, sounds lucrative. This is not true in rural Georgia. My Uncle Kevin owned the store, and it was more of a hobby than a viable business. Uncle Kevin enjoyed hunting, and the business allowed him to interact with the top hunters in our area of the state. Uncle Kevin suffered a stroke a few months before I graduated from Georgia Tech, so I took over the store. Instead of requiring me to establish a new business from scratch, as my brother and sister did, Pennsylvania gave me the option to operate a store. The benefit was that I didn't have to start a new firm during an economic slump when credit was nearly non-existent. The disadvantage was that the growth potential was limited. When Letty puked on our bathroom floor, I had owned the store for seven years and was the world's foremost expert on restricted development potential. I was really delighted that none of my five employees missed a single paycheck as a result of the poor economy and COVID's unpredictable nature. And I was certain that with some capital enhancements, I could make the store more profitable. But I didn't qualify for a loan. I don't have sufficient collateral to cover the danger. Furthermore, Credit institutions are particularly risk-averse when it comes to funding firearm sales. Letty was hired at every level because it was the only company in the area large enough to require a full-time accountant. As a result, Letty has spent very little for her qualifying nations. With Letty's pay and what I bring home from the store, we barely make ends meet. In reality, we were outperforming many in the neighborhood, and we had nothing to complain about. When life throws us curveballs, such as a broken water heater or a faulty starter in my pickup, we tighten our belts and make do with less. Like everyone else, cash payments at shows have significantly improved our quality of life. When Bowden Teague offered her to work at an exhibition, she never said no. It took Letty and I ten minutes to clean up her vomit. We labored silently. Neither of us said anything. Letty didn't want to explain what she was doing at home, dressed for another man. I didn't trust my ability to control my temper. I'm usually slow to become irritated or lose my temper. However, on rare instances when I become agitated, I struggle with self-control. Today is one of such occasions. I've learned that it's a lot simpler to avoid losing your temper in the first place than it is to control yourself once you've lost it. I've been working on it for a few years. When we finished cleaning, I wanted us to go into the living room and talk quietly about everything. Letty explained that she needed to leave since she would be late. When I asked where she needed to go, she shut her mouth and jutted her jaw. She can be really stubborn. After 15 minutes of increasingly harsh inquiries, which she refused to answer, she stated that she needed to go the restroom. Two minutes later, I caught her trying to slip out of the garage with a fresh outfit on a hanger. She was almost out the door when I noticed. This is where I reacted. After a few minutes, I was able to stop her and place her in a chair. I was hoarse from shouting. The only positive thing was that I now had her entire attention. 
She watched me lose my rage and was scared of being the target of it. She was physically safe. My rage was seldom violent, but Letty had no idea that I terrified her and treated her like a first-class asshole. The good is that as she sat in the room, she realized she wasn't going anywhere and needed to chat, I asked. So, where are you going? The answer should not be some shady, bogus trade exhibition in Atlanta. She burst into tears. Later on, I asked her, of all people, did you pick Bowden Teague? This man is a pig, and you truly despised him. Yes, I loathe him. I cannot stand him. I knew it was true. Allow his accounting duties to fall to Teague's marketing department. She had to communicate with him weekly. He was nice to her, but she disliked how he handled the other women in the office. She virtually danced with joy when one of the inventory department directors reported his harassment to human resources. This was hardly the first case of harassment. Mr. Cope, have you placed Teague on probation? Teague, you should have been fired. But Mr. Cope believed he was a marketing genius. Despite this, Teague kept his job. This was the final straw for his wife. When she discovered this, she left him, taking her two tiny children with her. I questioned if you couldn't stand him. Why did you go to his place? I was heading to a motel, not his house. Simply answer the darn question, Letty. I lost my bet. Money. Sure bet. I bet him that Georgia would defeat Clemson last week. Clemson won the game. Technically, Clemson not only won the game, but they also outscored the spread by more than two touchdowns. This was not surprising given that Georgia was rebuilding before Clemson. They lost five games and were far worse than Georgia. The story was now beginning to make sense. Letty has four older brothers. All five siblings were born within a year of each other, and having four older brothers as rivals shaped her into the most spectacular, super competitive trash talker I've ever seen. Her full name is Violet. Violet, although she looks nothing like her, she could seize a man's face in the blink of an eye. The more she despises someone, the more derogatory things she says. So the family began calling her Letty. As a Georgia alumnus, she enjoys brag-worthy moments and appears to wager on her beloved bulldogs. This is a perilous activity for someone with only a passing interest in sports. What were the stakes, Letty? She sniffles before discussing the vacation to the British Virgin Islands. Ten days at an all-inclusive resort, including a supper cruise on a sailboat. Bowden brings his wife and children there every year. I'd get your and my tickets in February. The stakes were really high for us. That is, if you win. What happens if he wins? Originally, the bet was that if he won, he would have me for the entire weekend. Will he get you this weekend? What does this mean? I knew exactly what that meant, but I wanted her to say it herself. Andy, this means I'll be available. What exactly does he have at his disposal? Letty, prepare. Clean the toilets and paint the house. She spoke quietly while looking down and away from me. She said, do whatever he wants in the bedroom. Are you discussing sex? She reddened. Yes, Andy, I mean sex. I took three full breaths before asking in the softest tone possible. Letty, don't you think you should have started this with sex? I am ashamed, Andy. She began crying again. Before she could continue, I responded, let us go back a little earlier. You mentioned original bets. What does this mean? She genuinely did not want to answer this question. I started to lose control of myself again and let go. Let's see how angry I get. She immediately began chatting. We choose the double or zero route. If I win, he will still provide first-class travel for two people and $2,000 in cash. What happens if he wins? I had to do what I had said previously, but I also had to agree. It was really tough for her to say this phrase. Agree to consume numerous forbidden substances on a daily basis for his sake. He taunts me about being Miss Goody Goody and says he wants to see me relaxed with my hair down. Prohibited substances. Are you joking? He guaranteed that by Sunday afternoon I'd be sober as a glass. Letty's heaviest illicit substance was a margarita on the rocks, which she consumed occasionally. I didn't want to ask this question, but I needed to. Who won the first bet that brought you to the double or zero game? She answered. I, she won a trip to the British Virgin Islands and then increased her money to cover additional airfare and expenses. She chose the Bulldogs, despite their current downturn and the high stakes. I covered my face with my palm and stepped out onto the terrace behind our house. Letty put her virtue on the line, won and then doubled down. It was quite difficult to get through this. 
I had to walk for a few minutes in the cool evening air before I could talk normally again, and I announced I was returning home. You aren't going anywhere. The bet has been canceled. I own your body and you own mine. You cannot wager on something that does not belong to you. Just like I can't gamble on my Uncle Kevin's farm. Andy, I do not speak Welsh. He has tried to speak Welsh several times, and I always call him out in front of his department for it. I burnt and humiliated him. He will do the same with me. How many times have you argued thus far? Letty, 24. In the last two years, I've won 24 times in row. She was ridiculously proud of it, mentioning some of the bets. All of them were based on the assumption that teams from the top 20 would defeat teams from the bottom. I explained that before last week's bet, Bowden had always chosen the team from the cellar, and then you lost your 25th bet. What was at issue was your devotion to me and your use of illegal narcotics, and all this time, you hadn't considered whether you were being set up. Why did this happen? This loser is such a poor gambler that he had never won against me until last week. Letty, you were set up. Until recently, every team he bet on was a sure loser. He lost purposefully. I was proud of how calmly I stated this and then asked, And what happened in the prior 24 bets? She answered, The typical rate was a Target gift card worth $1.20, the last six or seven dollar 100 Target cards. She fucking loved Target cards and nearly broke our marriage because of them. I emptied out the remaining beer and grabbed some bourbon from the shelf over the refrigerator. I put it into two fingers and added a few ice cubes. While doing so, I responded. After 24 consecutive bets on little amounts that were easily hidden from me, he unexpectedly increased the duration to 10 days at an all-inclusive Caribbean resort. Didn't that scare you? Her eyes grew huge. She certainly did not look at it from another perspective. Bowden stated that after his wife left him, he did not want to go on their yearly trip. He explained that he had already paid for it and that otherwise the money would be wasted. It made sense for him to make a bet with her. Isn't this a plausible explanation? Tig clearly had Letty imprisoned under her own vanity and selfishness. The look on her face is comprehensible. At least she had the courtesy to be ashamed, I asked. How much does this vacation cost in monetary terms? Is it enough that his wife wants to recover half of the costs in her divorce proceedings? Her lack of response was revealing. I continued, Have you seen the tickets or the booking confirmation? How did you know he had booked the trip? When I questioned about it, Letty appeared to be sick. Realization dawned, and my wife began to comprehend Teague's strategy. It's time to complete it as P.A. would have done it. Letty, have you considered what it would be like to spend the weekend agreeing that he could do whatever he wanted with you? Her expression was perplexed. She certainly hadn't considered this. She imagined it would be like one of those intense love novels she enjoyed. She didn't consider what someone like Tig could do. I stated the terms were whatever he wanted, correct? Yes. Andy, is there any form of sex you refuse to have? She blushed and gazed at the floor, but she continued spoke. Do you know what it is? And you agreed to a bet that you wouldn't be able to deny him what you usually denied me. What if Bowden decides to do this all weekend? What if he wants to keep you doing this for hours? Did you also agree to this? She looked disgusted. Her expression shifted to terror, and she trembled and began to wail loudly. Resign yourself, sweetheart. There's one more thing. You aren't using birth control. We are very cautious about what we do. And when do we do it? What if Bowden decides he'd rather not have to use protection? When did your last period end? Two weeks ago. Aren't you ovulating this weekend? What if he expects you to give birth to his child? You consented to it. Letty instantly began vomiting. I delivered the kitchen trash can to her. She leaned over him and screamed repeatedly. However, nothing came out. My wife's look indicated that it was as empty as before. I realized she finally understood everything perfectly. She cried sadly, What a fool I am, Andy. I did not want this. It never occurred to me that he would or could do that. I was so confident that I would win. I had previously decided what I would take with me. I should not have placed the bet when I lost. I should have told you. Should have known Welsh. What was I thinking? She began sobbing. I sighed, tired. Lee. It's hard to believe, but my wife is a very intelligent woman. She is a qualified public accountant who graduated with honors from Georgia. Mr. Cope dubbed Letty the Enchantress because of her brilliant abilities to remove earnings from his publications. However, 
She was the youngest and sole girl in a family of seven. Her father is a pastor in a tiny church, and her tall, strong brothers guarded her ferociously. They scared away everyone who did not appreciate Letty as much as they did. Only a few were brave enough to face this torture. So, before she became engaged to me, Letty lived a quiet life in a little village. She was duped in this manner simply because of her naivety. She had no idea how nasty people could be to one another. When combined with her almost complete lack of creativity about sex, it's understandable that an intellectual woman might find herself in this scenario. It was also her first introduction to high-stakes gambling. We both know she is a thrill-seeker. Since we began dating, I have kept her secure from harm. But this time, I wasn't present, and she got carried away. Her entire face was covered with snot and tears as she sat in the chair. She couldn't even remove it herself. I gently cleaned her face with a damp kitchen towel. I expected it to calm her down, but it had the opposite effect. Her sobs grew heavier. I pounded the table and said, Letty, I need you to listen to me right now. Concentrate, please. Letty got herself together again, I continued. This is immediate divorce nonsense. There are no lies without exaggeration. Do not pass past. Do not collect dollar two hundred. Get your divorce immediately away. Understand? Do you know how close I am to pressing the eject lever right now? Especially after I caught you and you still attempted to flee? Letty nodded. Her mouth was tightly shut to keep from weeping. I said, I love you with all my heart and do not want to divorce you. But you have to explain all of this to me. When she did not respond, I began hammering her with questions. Are you tired of me? Did I disappoint you? Are you upset with me? Am I not good enough for you? How could you do this to us? When I asked these questions, I unconsciously let out a cry of pain. I blamed myself for being taught to never engage in self-pity, no matter how hard I tried. I could not keep it to myself. I was worried my questions would make her cry again, but they really made her feel better. She responded angrily. No, honey, this is not you at all. You're the best dude I've ever met. I am completely satisfied, Andy, and I want to get married to you. You're the man I need, only you. I paid special attention to her face. She isn't lying to me. She is stating the truth. This is why it is so difficult for me to comprehend the situation. This is terrible, I responded. I hope you are telling the truth. You'll have to do a lot of work to get everything in order before we get engaged. I explained my position on infidelity. Only me and everyone. As soon as you do something to another person first, it's over between us. You understand, right? Letty responded. I feel the same way if you ever do. My temper surged, and I interrupted her. Whoa, whoa, no, don't say that. Have I ever given you a reason to mistrust my loyalty? My wife shakes her head. This incident was a significant failure on your behalf. I continued. I've never had such failures. You and I are not morally equivalent. I've never made moves toward infidelity. But you, if I came home half an hour later, you'd be well on your way to becoming Teague's toy. And if this occurs, the divorce will be unstoppable. I never put you in the situation I am in today. I paused to calm myself down again, noticing that my thoughts were going in circles and that I was beginning to get angry. I pulled myself together and forced myself to move forward. Did anyone witness your bet? I asked. Was anyone else participating in the discussion about this? Letty shakes her head. Then he is the only one who knows you're breaking your word. Everyone else will believe he is lying or exaggerating, even if they know the truth. It wouldn't matter. Nobody expects you to do what he suggests. If saying no makes you feel guilty, you'll have to deal with it. It's better to be a happily married word breaker and live with the consequences than to have an unhappy divorce. Tig to eye, living with ten times the disgrace, she sobbed and nodded in agreement. We are completely in accord. I inquired how you communicate with Tig. How did you plan this weekend? We spoke at the office. He tried to write to me on my mobile, but I refused and banned him. He handed me a phone in the office yesterday, but I never used it. Where is he? In my purse. I scooped up her purse from the floor of the closet. It included a cheap prepaid phone. Is he? She nodded. I looked through the phone. There was one SMS sent with the word test. There have been multiple incoming SMS messages in the last hour. Teague wanted to know why she had been gone for so long. I asked, is there anything else you should tell me that we haven't previously discussed? If I discover later that you are hiding something else, it is over between us. You understand, don't you? She shakes her head. 
This is all. You already know everything I stated. Then it's fine. Please, please, can I trust you now? Are you going to try to evade me again? No. She responded with an impulsive change of heart at the last second, accompanied by unexpected bitterness. I am not going away, Andy. You're my dude. I will do everything you say. I am not going anywhere. He unlocked the door while praying silently. She attempted to smother me with kisses. Now I truly did not want to kiss her. The traces of snot and the scent of vomit came from the rage. I was totally out of my head. However, she was persuasive. After a minute of holding my breath, I pushed her away and sent her upstairs to shower and clean our teeth, insisting on no contact with Teague for any reason. We need to prepare, she agreed as she passed me. I stroked her arm to get her to stop. Letty, I like this pair of underpants on you. Please do me a favor and take a selfie in front of the bathroom mirror with this ensemble. Will you do that for me? She smiled and nodded as she showered and prepared. I went to Lonnie's cookout, which was half a mile from my place. I grabbed a few platters to go, fried chicken and pork with a variety of sides. This was our favorite dish. It was still early for dinner, but I figured food might help. While I was waiting, my phone rang. Letty texted me a selfie. She straightened her hair into a ponytail, tidied up her face, and applied cosmetics exactly how I like it. She knows just how to press my buttons. The photograph stole my breath away. The realization of how close we had come to disaster that evening struck me with barely restrained wrath. For this, I demanded my pound of flesh from Tig, and he considered how to get it without going to prison. And then I realized that if I involved Lettuce Brothers in this problem, I would most likely not have to do anything. While we were eating, I told Letty that I understand how sensitive you are to your brother's teasing. I will do my best to keep this little incident between us. Neither my family nor yours should be aware of this. Her expression conveyed her deep gratitude to me. But you and I both agree that something must be done about Bowden Teague. What he did constituted significant predation. If we do nothing, he will begin looking for someone else, for someone who lacks our resources and is unable to defend themselves. We must be responsible. There must be adults in this room. She nodded and stated, I want him to face justice for what he did. I asked you what justice meant to you. I don't believe he broke any laws with what he did to you. Let us examine what he did to entice you to sleep with him. It was horrible, but not unlawful. She remained silent for a while before I added, We do have something we can work with, though. Now he's in a hotel room with illegal stuff. This is illegal and may lead to his arrest. To accomplish something like this, we'll have to get Vicky or Little Joe engaged. She groaned in fear. I said, Well, Little Joe isn't afraid to break the rules, and VK will always follow the rules. I would prefer to use VK because he is more likely to keep his mouth shut. Plus, he's been asking me to borrow PA's antique ski boat for a while now so he can take Newt and split on inflatable cheesecake rides. With this, I can try to buy his silence. Little Joe has guaranteed results. He will stop Bowden regardless of the cost. I'll let you decide. She gathered her courage and said better than VK. I also do not trust Little Joe to keep his mouth shut. I called VK. He responded on the first ring. Andy, how are you and my gorgeous sister doing? I responded. Not very good, VK. Are you on duty today? No, fine. I'll need a large favor from you for this. I will be very grateful to you. An SUV from the sheriff's department arrived 20 minutes later. Pull it up into our driveway. VK has abandoned his older brother, the scariest of the four. VS is the county's top deputy sheriff. There are a lot of accountable parties in our state. Sheriffs are elected officials who may not have prior law enforcement expertise. The chief deputy sheriff is the highest ranking law enforcement officer, the one who knows how to get the job done and operate the department, whereas the sheriff handles political matters and interacts with the commissioner and the public. S is our county's chief deputy sheriff, and he does a fantastic job. Unlike his predecessor, he commanded the respect of minority communities. Old city people anticipate that when the current sheriff retires, VK will become the county's sheriff for the next 20 years. I informed VK about what had occurred to Letty, and Bowden went to save her from shame. I explained everything. VK was initially amused by his sister's lack of discernment. Did you bet double or zero on George's triumph over Clemson this year? Damn that! No way! This is absolute foolishness! VK exclaimed. 
But as I went on to describe the setup and illegal substances, his happy demeanor dwindled. He became progressively furious. When VK becomes furious, he does not lose his cool as I do. His lips are firmly squeezed together, and his eyes are glittering. That's what makes him so dangerous. I added, now this asshole is in the garden of room 223. He should carry illegal substances with him. Is it possible to examine his room on some pretext? Perhaps you could engage a K-9 service to find him. VK stated that he had a few ideas and walked outside to his SUV to make some private phone calls. He returned with a smile and announced, Good news. An unidentified customer contacted 911 from the Garden Inn's house phone. He stated that he overheard a man in room 223 of the Garden purchasing illegal narcotics from a dealer. If the door is open when my people arrive, we'll have everything we need to conduct a legal search. And Letty inquired, Can't you pretend you're going there and ask him to keep the door open for you for the past hour? Bowden Teague has been calling the hotline every several minutes, leaving voicemails. He couldn't wait to know when she'd come. I handed her the phone and spoke directly to him. Assume you're in the parking lot, but you're concerned about being spotted standing in the lobby waiting for the doors to open. Ask him to keep it open so you may enter straight away. She typed and sent an SMS. Teague did not respond to the request, but did write in response. Where have you gone so far? Her phone suddenly rang. I told her not to respond. If he starts speaking to him, he'll probably give us away. Write him an answer. Say I arrived suddenly and it took you a while to leave me. Teague responded. If you want the door to stay open, you must be interested in me. Letty asked. What shall I do? I had an epiphany on my cell phone. I responded with a selfie of Letty wearing lingerie in the bathroom mirror, precisely cropped, so that he could see from the top of her bra to the top of her stockings, and sent it to Lenny's phone over Bluetooth. He then asked Letty to send him an SMS. The close-up of her underpants was exposing but not recognizable. This photograph caused the man to lose his wits. Bowden's reaction was instantaneous. He sent a response, SMS, best weekend ever. A second later, Teague shared an image from inside a hotel room with the door wide open. VK made a phone call to get things started before sitting down with me in the living room. I used a pretense to send Letty upstairs for a few minutes. When she went, I implored VK to be kinder to Letty. I realize I already owe you a lot of money for this, but Letty is extremely sensitive to deception. She is a bright woman, yet she is gullible and easily duped. I know you really wanted to take the yacht I got from my father. If you keep it between the three of us, I'll give you one weekend every month for the rest of the year. You get to choose which ones, and I'll even keep them tucked in for you. VK laughed and told Andy, You don't owe me anything. You acted to defend my sister. I expected this from you. Otherwise, I would not have allowed you to date her. However, I am thankful to you. What you have asked me to do is literally my job. Catching him is the least I can do. When it comes to maintaining secrets, I adore little Joe. But you know how his tongue hangs out on both ends, if he discovered what had happened to Letty, the entire neighborhood would know before noon the following day. He will not allow her to endure this. And that is a fact. Consider me to be sensible and prudent. I agreed and apologized for any possible negative outcomes. He grinned and spoke. I still want to borrow your boat. Your father's old ski boat will suffice for one time. It would be lovely in June when school finishes, and I can take the kids on a weekday gasoline trip at my expense. We shook hands as they waited. Letty came down to visit her brother. Letty desperately wanted to have children. We decided to postpone this until we had access to the trust. My sister looked forward to it, but my brother did not. Both encouraged us to wait. Letty liked parenting while caring for our numerous nephews. She interrogated VK relentlessly about what was going on with his children. Newt and Rascal are her favorite nephews. At the end, VK called. He laughed in a few points, but said nothing noteworthy. After a few minutes of listening, VK replied, Okay, Darnell, great job. Thank Carlos on my behalf as well. He then informed us that Baudouin Teague had been detained at the Garden Inn just a few minutes earlier on accusations of possessing a controlled drug with intent to distribute. Finally, they were found on him. He had a big amount. Empty the bags and scales. This signifies the intention to disseminate. He will almost certainly face prison time for this. Letty, you should avoid dealing with unlawful substances. 
They are not only extremely addictive, but they also reduce sexual inhibition. I did my best to keep myself under control. Letty moved her palm gently down my back. VK continued. The probable reason of the anonymous tip was not particularly strong, but Bowden gave himself away. He was smoking in his chamber when the sheriff came by. Deputies stepped inside after smelling smoke and finding the door open. Teague attempted to shove them out during the scuffle. He dumped a bag containing illegal narcotics in the corridor in front of four witnesses, including the hotel manager and the on-duty repairman. Following this, he became hostile and resisted the aid required to restrain him. Darnell Billups was the officer that arrested the suspect. He was the one who had done it. Do you know Darnell? He is a regular customer in my store. I nodded. Letty shook her head negatively as W.C. proceeded. Bowden was two years ahead of me in school, and his father was a state legislator at the time. He started college four years before you began high school. So you didn't know him from high school. He bullied kids. Darnell was eventually able to exact his retribution 15 years later. Darnell agreed to treat my wife and me to a steak meal in exchange for sending him on this quest. We had a nice laugh over that. Darnell's father was a diesel mechanic who worked for Pennsylvania. He moved between dealerships based on the type of repair work required. The Darnells were decent people. PA taught me to respect excellent people. I was relieved he got his retribution. Letty asked. And what happens to Bowden? VK responded. Do you know Laney Wilcox? He is the district attorney, yet he is ruthless when it comes to illegal narcotics. Intent to distribute carries a required sentence. If I am not mistaken, he will make an example of Mr. Teague. He then stared at Letty. Darnell was able to seize Teague's cell phone. Is there anything about this phone that you would feel embarrassed about? Texts, emails, phone calls, or photographs? Letty responded, just the photo we just sent from the past two years. We phoned each other a few times while at trade to negotiate work schedules. That's all I want is for this photo to disappear, VK responded. Already taken care of, when the scene is cleared, Teague's phone is discovered broken and reported damaged during the incident. You owe Darnell for this. Darnell would buy a couple boxes of 9mm ammo from me every month, then a pallet of 12-gauge shells at the end of the summer. He had a checking account and made monthly payments throughout the year. I mentally noted that this year's payment would be at the expense of the establishment. In addition, he would go to the store around once a month to look for a good price on a rifle for his eldest son. A few days ago, I swapped in a good condition Remington 870 Wingmaster. I'll give him a really decent bargain on Darnell. I'll take care of everything, I said, leaving everything as is. VK nodded, indicating comprehension. Letty questioned him. What if Bowden claims he was in the room waiting for me? Bowden responded. He will not say. He was detained for possessing controlled narcotics. He is intelligent enough to recognize that no one will trust him. Second, your phone is the only way you can be traced. His cell phone is shattered. If he complains about his broken phone, we will obtain a warrant to investigate internet backups and he will bury himself. Darnell examined his phone and discovered that the most recent text messages were from Teague's dealer. There is a record of the incriminating transactions. Teague is unlikely to say something that draws attention to the phone. There is no indication that you ever possessed this phone. I'll take it, and it will go, Letty asked. Can't you trace the phone to this house? VK responded. A determined investigator can collect records from the cell phone carrier and triangulate the device. In a big metropolis, it is likely that it can be tracked within a half to quarter mile radius. The countryside has far fewer towers. The search can only be reduced to an eight mile radius. There are 100 dwellings within an eight mile radius of here. So the answer isn't as straightforward. If everything else fails, I shall take leadership of the probe. Vic looked at us both and said, there's one more thing you should know. When they examined the room, they discovered some high-end filming equipment. These cameras are undetectable but offer great resolution. One of them was on the curtain rod. The other was placed on the chest of drawers. The assistants would have missed them if they hadn't been looking for them. When the assistants entered the room, both were already working. He possessed illegal chemicals and blackmail cameras. I need to sketch you an image of how you were framed. Do not worry about yourself, Letty. Your husband's family is reputed to be wealthy. Perhaps he was the intended target, not you. What might Tig do to Andy? 
Her face became white as she realized you were carrying damning materials to blackmail her. She didn't respond. There's nothing to say. Fine. You nearly escaped a bullet because VK requested to speak with Letty alone. I stepped out into the hallway and gave them the room. I glanced at them while he whispered to her, while he was doing it. Letty gazed into my eyes and started crying again. That was too much for me. I turned aside. When VK was about to go, I thanked him warmly, but he dismissed it as trivial. Here, families look after one another. Later that evening, I asked Letty what VK had told her. He warned that if I ever did to you what our mother did to us, I should pack my belongings and leave the district. Otherwise, he will chastise me and make me scream out in grief. That terrified me to death, and I've never seen my brother so angry. This refers to the fact that his mother, Loretta, fled from her husband while Letty and her brothers were children. This man turned out to be a lawyer. When I was younger, my father had many modest car businesses in South Georgia. He had a complete team of lawyers working for him from the Augusta Partnership. One of the lawyers went there every week to talk with P.A. about current cases. During each of these journeys, the lawyer stopped for lunch at the restaurant where Loretta worked as a server. She had to work there to support her family. His family was quite respectable. However, poor country preachers such as Letty and Father were never wealthy. Loretta was both beautiful and a lawyer. P.A. liked her. She battled in life with her fate. The lawyer was a gorgeous man with good conversation skills. He gradually captivated Loretta, eventually persuading her to abandon her family for him. He promised her a comfortable and opulent life in the major city of Augusta. He also mentioned that in a year or two, the children would be able to move in with them. Loretta's decision to flee with him was made simple by this. His father, Roy, was stunned by the incident and lost his position in the church as a result of the controversy. P.A. was infuriated. The lawyer was his employee, whom he brought to the city and held personally responsible. P.A. promptly fired the lawyer. The day Roy's church deacons begged him to resign. My father hired him as the sales manager for his Ford and Lincoln dealerships. This represented a huge boost in compensation when compared to the salary of a preacher. P.A. attempted to support Roy and issue a statement to the community. It worked, but with an unforeseen result. It was the best business choice P.A. has ever made. Roy had a reputation for honesty and respect, and he sold numerous cars to the underprivileged. Under Roy's direction, the Ford dealership became the foundation of Pennsylvania's corporate empire. Over the next two years, Pennsylvania and Roy became close friends, a nasty businessman who everyone fears, and a discredited preacher. Roy was loved by everyone, but he could not cook, and his children believed he could set fire to water. Moore was troubled by the prospect of his five growing children eating frozen dinners every night. So the Roys were regulars at Sunday supper. Moore followed tradition and spent time with Letty so she could learn to cook. Letty, the lone girl, yearned and wanted her mother's care and attention. She and Ma shared the same sense of humor and could laugh at each other for hours. Every Sunday afternoon, Letty and Moore would spend hours cooking and joking. I realized I'd fallen in love with Letty while sitting at our kitchen table on a Sunday afternoon. I'm watching her gently knead the cookie dough. The tip of her nose was stained with flour. She remarked something pleasantly, which made my mother laugh so hard that she couldn't stand still. Letty looked at me, winked, and smiled as if to say, Isn't your mother wonderful? At that point, my heart began to race in my chest. I felt giddy and light as air. I was 15 and Letty was 14. She developed early and was the most stunning thing I'd ever seen. I can still remember exactly how I felt at that time. It was the greatest sensation in the world. VK was the first to detect my feelings on Letty. Shortly after that Sunday, he pulled me aside to talk. VK was four years older than me, standing 15 centimeters and 36 kilos taller. He said, I know you are in love with Letty Andy. It's written over your face. My sister, despite her efforts to hide it, has the same deep sentiments for you as you do for her. I'm offering you a deal if you respect her. I will interfere in my father's and brother's affairs to keep them away from you. I am an excellent judge of people, and I believe you will look after her. This is what I expected. You will care for her. Don't disappoint me, Andy. Then it appeared to me that he was exceedingly generous. Years later, I knew VK was willing to go to any length for me. My parents took it upon themselves to lead their family with decency and respect. 
P.A. and Ma assisted them when they needed it the most. V.K. was quite intelligent and knew what this meant for his family. P.A. was a vindictive man. Months after the lawyer was fired, he was still enraged, and he would go to any length to make the lawyer regret his choice to urge Loretta to run away with him. P.A. hired the top investigators in the state. Investigators gathered a plethora of damaging evidence against the lawyer and used it to slowly grind him to dust. In three months, the lawyer lost multiple cases, a partnership, a license, a fortune, and a house. Finally, Loretta. P.A. simply spilled the correct dirt to the right person at the right time. When Roy found out what had happened to the lawyer, he went by our house. He told P.A. that the administration of justice brings gladness to the upright, but fear to those who do wrong, Proverbs 21.15. It's encouraging to know that I have people who the Lord is using to bring about justice. P.A. dismissed it as nothing. Families here take care of one another. V.K. paid me a visit on my day off a few months after Teague's arrest. He claimed there was an incident at Glenville State Prison and that Bowden Teague had died. I asked V.K. what had happened. He claimed that after Teague consented to the minimum punishment, the state transferred him to Glenville. During the first week of his captivity, Teague was killed. It could have been any of hundreds of witnesses, but no one said anything. He stated that the warden contacted the sheriff to see whether anyone in the region held a vendetta against Teague. The chief informed the sheriff that there were allegations in the prison that several years ago, Teague met a young Hispanic woman who worked at a bar, got her addicted to illegal narcotics, and wrecked her marriage. According to rumors, when the family discovered he was in Glenville, they paid off a notorious Central American gang to exact retribution. The sheriff requested the VC to look into this and contact the chief again. I asked, and what did you tell your boss? He responded thoughtfully. I investigated everything but found nothing. Hypothetically, if I knew who this family was, I'd probably not inform the boss. The family would be accused of conspiracy to commit murder. This is a really serious charge, the legal battle against which will be costly. Perhaps the family has no involvement in this problem because it is only a rumor in the prison yard. Even if the story is true, the individual who informed the family that Tig is in Glenville is not guilty of anything. The fact that Tig is in prison is widely known. The man merely brought this to their attention. I told him that I overheard his father quoting P.A.'s parables. He had never heard this story before and was shocked. I looked at his face to see whether he comprehended what I said. When I was certain, I understood. I commented, It's nice to know I have friends too. V.K. grinned warmly and rubbed my shoulder, saying, I am glad we understand each other so well. Andy. Letty could not have selected a better man. In the weeks since I caught her, Letty and I attempted to have sex a half dozen times. I was still upset, and I was having problems following through. This had never occurred to me before, and it left me absolutely disheartened. As soon as the time came, I became as slow as a noodle. Letty misinterpreted this as a refusal and wept uncontrollably for several hours. This did not help me much either. I decided to visit my doctor. My doctor certified me physically healthy and recommended me to a psychologist. Meadows Arana, an old hippie woman, was the psychologist he recommended. Her office is located in Matt Cone. Meadow appealed to me greatly. She is down to earth, worldly, and approaches the problem with comedy, which I found extremely amusing. I gave her the account of what happened, using humor and irony to alleviate her anguish. She laughed in all the areas where I would laugh if someone told me this story in a similar manner. She has an amazing whole-body chuckle. She worked with me twice a week for several months to help me cope with my anger in a positive way as I learned to regulate it properly. My functionality has returned. However, making love with Letty was sloppy and awkward. My faith in her remained damaged. I treated the symptoms but did not address the core issue. Letty softly supported me when I scheduled couples counseling with Meadow. Meadow started couples counseling by asking us to discuss our aspirations. My aspirations were unexpectedly different from Latte's. I stated, my goal is to overcome my anger and feelings of betrayal. I want to reestablish our trust to where it was before I returned home, Letty responded. My goal is to figure out if I am so dang foolish. Seriously, that is what she told the consultant. When Letty said that, the meadow practically burst. She laughed so hard that she was unable to talk for about a minute. She abruptly stopped laughing, sat up, and exclaimed, Damn it, Letty, you made me wet myself. 
and she dashed into the bathroom. The way it was done made both Letty and I laugh out loud. It was therapeutically beneficial, for the first time in a long while. I relaxed around Letty, putting my hand in hers. She smiled at me for the first time in weeks. Meadow was surprisingly effective at assisting us. However, it was not easy. I can't image how much more difficult it would have been if Letty had only gotten to Teague's hotel room for a few minutes. I often thank my lucky stars that I caught it right before leaving. For the first three sessions, we walked in circles. What concerned me the most was that Letty was plainly excited by the possibility of being sexually exploited by a man she disliked. The stories that sprang to me as I considered the causes for her reaction carried me to a dark place. Letty, for her part, denied being aroused on multiple occasions. This was extremely frustrating because it was so physically visible. Meadow and I discussed the necessity in individual talks, and she was aware that this was my biggest issue. At the fourth consultation, idealist Meadow had had enough of lettuce blandishments and duped her into admitting her erection. After acknowledging this, Letty burst into tears. Meadow spent the remainder of the session researching how lettuce arousal made me feel. For the first time, I believe Letty comprehended the depth of my emotions and the self-doubt I was experiencing. She left that session with a grim desire to help me understand her behavior and reclaim my faith in myself. For the next month, sessions were limited to Letty and Meadow. Meadow startled me with her first question as we resumed our doubles practice. She reiterated the terms of the bet and asked whether I wanted to obtain the same offer from Letty someday. I answered by speaking directly to Letty. I'd love to make the same bargain with you as Tig did. Without the illicit stuff, of course. I wanted to try so many things with you, but you wouldn't let me. You even declined to try something you obviously enjoyed. I'd do anything to have you as my slave, and I could do anything I wanted with you. Hell, sure, all day, every day. Letty glanced at me, shocked and surprised. I questioned sarcastically, how is it possible that you are unaware of my feelings for you? My wife blushed bright red as she continued, Andy, I come from a very conservative family. I, Letty, remained mute without finishing her idea. Meadow sensed her pain and asked, Letty, do you remember what we talked about? You must be honest and forthright. We should tell him about the phone call. He should know. I carefully waited to hear what my wife would say. She gathered her strength and began shortly before my mother left us. I got home early one day because softball practice was canceled. When I returned, I overheard my mother speaking on the phone. She spoke candidly about sex. I assumed she was talking to dad, and she was. I had never seen this side of my parents before. This both offended and pleased me. My mother left us a week later, and when I arrived home, I expected dad to be there, but he had been called to the hospital. Because of this visit, I was the one who discovered the note she had placed on the kitchen table. The note was written to my father, but I read it from the letter. My mother claimed that my father never supplied her with an adequate quality of living and did not please her sexually. So she is leaving to find someone who can do both. The letter included divorce papers. I only realized later that she was on the phone with the man she fled with, not her father. It was traumatic. I never got over it, and it gave me a negative perception of female sexuality. This story startled me. The fact is, Andy, I have a really powerful libido. I received it from my mother. I'm sure Meadow forced me to complete a survey. And based on my reactions, it is at the top of my list. She turned to our consultant. What was the result? Meadow responded, Letty is more than two sigma above the median 95%. Her self-rated libido is greater than 97% of all women. Letty nodded and admitted, I've been masking and hiding this side of myself from you for years. And I did this for two reasons. First and foremost, I was scared you would find in me a resemblance to my mother, a dissolute lady whose ambitions outweigh her duty to the family. Second, I was terrified to let the beast out of its prison. I was terrified that if I gave in to my passion, it would consume me. I suppressed it to avoid losing control. Meadow remarked calmly after a lengthy time. You must continue, Letty. You should talk about your arousal that day. You know how much Andy was harmed during our previous group session. You must be as open as possible. Letty spoke after I lost my last bet with Bowden, in which both illegal substances and my virtue were at issue. I expected to feel horrified and filled with terror, but it unexpectedly caught fire. I was excited all day. 
It had nothing to do with Bowden. He disgusted me. It was not about infidelity. I didn't want to cheat on you, and I was fully satisfied with you. What piqued my interest was the prospect of doing something I couldn't acknowledge to myself I wanted, the possibility of being forced into. This seemed quite liberating to me. It was not because of Bowden. I'm not cheating on you. The idea is that I could let the beast out of the cage without feeling bad. I couldn't wait to see what it was like. I stared at Meadow, perplexed. Is this real? Is Letty willing to be coerced into sexual actions to avoid guilt? This sounds like fiction. It is real, Meadow responded in English. A promiscuous lady is someone who has a lot of sexual partners. Women with high libidos struggle to balance their sexual desire with social pressure to discriminate in sexual relationships. This results in numerous behavioral patterns. First, women with high libidos frequently hide their sexuality. Second, they seek psychological justifications for their sexual partners. For example, the epidemic of intoxicated sex culture among students is one way in which women attempt to rationalize their strong libido. If they're inebriated, they can tell themselves, I'm not a slutty woman. I was simply inebriated in Lenny's instance. She claimed that being forced gave her a sense of freedom. She can tell herself, I am not a dissolute woman who chose this for herself. I was pushed, so I began snapping objects, but this is sophistry. In fact, she chose to interrupt me with a gesture of indignation, as if I were a particularly foolish pupil. Andy, you questioned if it was real, not whether it made sense or was rational. I know this sounds crazy to you, but avoiding guilt by externalizing your locus of control is a surprisingly common occurrence. It is speculated that this is one of the reasons why submissive sexual behavior appeals to a surprising proportion of the population. I thought about it and then asked Meadow, Do you believe Letty? Meadow responded, Letty and I have thoroughly discussed this issue, and I am completely convinced that she is telling the truth. Furthermore, I do not believe she is concealing any motivation other than what she stated. Unfortunately, my opinion is irrelevant. This is something you have to decide for yourself. Letty gazed at me carefully, anxiety on her face. She waited for me to say anything. I stared at Meadow, as did she. Confused? I asked. Did you have a question for me? Did I miss it? Meadow responded. For multiple sessions. You asked Letty to explain why she was so excited as she prepared to travel to the hotel. Tig, she simply handed it to him. Do you accept her explanation? That's all. As Dad pointed out, these were essential facts. Did I believe Letty and Meadow? I addressed Letty immediately. Letty, when we married, I promised you that I would be faithful to the rest of my life. No one compelled me to do this. I chose to make this vow because I loved you. You were. And stay amazing, attractive, and appealing. We got a little crazy when I promised to remain faithful. But I appreciate your wish to walk down the aisle as a virgin. I am aware that I have a very high libido, and I was concerned that yours would not match mine. When I saw you let loose at times, I hoped and prayed that we'd be in sync. Allow yourself to go. Have fun. Greedily taste delight. I interpreted that as a hint that you might equal my sexual passion. I walked to the altar, planning sexual adventures with you for the rest of my life. When we eventually made love, there were no disappointments. You weren't shy. You prefer to receive physical pleasure from me. And with each action in bed, you demonstrated that you loved me with your whole heart, body, and soul. However, throughout our marriage, you kept something from me. I didn't strive to do what I knew you wanted. You are resistant to experiments. She wouldn't allow us progress to the next level. I couldn't understand why this was causing me to have doubts about myself. The fact that you have a high libido does not bother me, offend me, or make me feel uneasy. It brings me delight. What irritates me is that you have a strong libido that you refuse to fully share with me. I still don't see why sex is harmful for married couples. To be honest, he is usually good. I heard your father preach on this topic before he left the ministry. He said that married couples' bodies belong to each other. I can't recall how he said it, but it was biblical. Married couples should cede control of their bodies to their husbands. They must keep each other alive so that they can resist the urge to betray their vows. Letty intervened. Corinthians. This is from Corinthians. I nodded. I accept your word for it. You know I'm not a Bible scholar. In any event, I believe I understand what your father taught. God provided the pleasure of sex in marriage as a consolation, as long as it happens within the context of a legitimate marriage. 
What spouses do in bed on their own free will does not offend God. If it is not offensive to God and provides us comfort, why don't we do it? Help me comprehend. Why do we avoid finding comfort in one another? If allowing me to make sexual decisions makes you feel less guilty, I'm more than willing to do so. I will take it. Accept the blame. As I previously stated, hell yes, all day, every day. For me. There's no fear, disgust, doubt, or sex. I only ask that you be honest with me. We decided to be companions for the rest of our lives. I believe I deserve the truth from you. The expression on Let's Face reaffirmed his decision. The correct one. Passion rushed inside, igniting with a blinding flame. I looked across to Maddow to see how she reacted, and the look on her face indicated that she believed I had struck the nail on the head. However, Meadow stated, Andy, you have not answered the question posed to you. Do you accept her explanation? I turned to my wife and said, Letty, in your explanation, you asked me to accept three things. First, admit that you had no desire, lust, or interest in having sex with Bowden when you heard these remarks. Her face tightened. I accept this wholeheartedly, I said. I believe it. Relief flooded over her face. Second, you wanted me to accept that you weren't disappointed in me, that you had no desire to cheat on me, and that you regard me as an outstanding sexual partner. Her face became tense again. I accept this wholeheartedly. I believe in it. She grinned even more broadly, her relief evident. Third, you requested me to agree that the reason you were aroused that day was because you were repressing your high libido and the possibility of being enslaved by a man who intended to use you sexually allowed you to fulfill your libido without feeling guilty. She grinned, awaiting my response. I completely disagree with this. I said to myself, that sounds like complete nonsense from a psychopath. Let his expression show horror. She closed her eyes and tears started streaming down her cheeks. Meadows' look was equal parts fear, panic, and disappointment. I went on, saying that agreeing with such a clear statement without any evidence would make me an idiot. What kind of a fool do you think I am? Before triggering the trap, I took a time to process what had just happened. During this period, Letty and Meadow each took a long breath before saying anything. I stated that your claims can be verified. I need evidence. I need a demonstration. Show that your statement is correct. Meadow screamed out laughing at the top of her lungs 15 seconds after Letty did. Only after this did Letty realize what I was saying. After that, Letty and I haggled for about 30 minutes. She made counter offers and then attempted to lower the price, and then completely implored me. I stood my ground. You are planning to give Tig three days. I want a full year. 365 days to do whatever I want with you. I'm at least 120 times more important to you than Bowden Teague. I believe this is sensible. In fact, I believe I am 1,200 times more important to you. So be thankful you're not requesting 10 years in less than a year. I grossly underestimated myself, she said. But Andy, you need to be realistic. I answered, Letty, the whole point of this exercise is that you are attempting to persuade me that giving a guy power over your sexuality gets you on by negotiating constantly to prevent me from taking control. You are merely weakening your argument. Meadow chuckled as I said this, and I got the idea that if she had popcorn, she would be eating it right now. Letty spoke. So what are you insisting on? Would you like me to agree to 365 days under your control? Do you promise me that after this, you will agree that I am telling the truth? I. Let's be quite precise. I'd like to apply inductive reasoning to check the truth of your statement. We will do numerous repeat observations under various settings in order to obtain a consistent result. Your obedience will decide how you feel about my authority in this situation. If your words are true, I expect to see 365 days of quick and full submission. Immediate and complete submission implies that you will do what I say when I say it. You are unwilling to bargain. You will not behave half-heartedly. I want you to ride or perish for a year. If you do this for a year, I will believe. She closed her mouth and lowered her jaw. Not a good indication. I started to worry that I had overplayed my hand and that my tactical success here would turn into a strategic loss, she asked. How long do I have to think about your proposal, I replied. I will allow you many days to think about it. Meadow requested me to spend the remainder of the session alone. Meadow smiled at me as they exited the consultant's office at the end of the session. Three days later, when I got home from shopping, 
Letty was waiting for me at the kitchen table. She had already drank two glasses of Chardonnay and was applying a bandage to the inside of her left wrist. I asked about the bandage. She peeled it off, the words jump or die etched neatly on her wrist in little type. She stated, I want to do this for you. As far as I understand it, I am your slave with whom you can do whatever you want for the next 365 days. I will not refuse you for any reason. If this remains within our marriage, I will ride or die. Nobody except you or me. This isn't discussed. I mentioned to you a few nights ago that this goes without saying. You're mine. I have no intention of sharing. She raised her wrist and stated, I ride or die. I got up and followed her to the bedroom. She was quite excited. Over the next year, hardly a single day went by without sex. I made sure we did something every day, no matter how tired, frustrated, or busy we were. I still did it. She kept her vow to never deny me anything. I respected her feelings about it, which made it easier for her. We spent the first few months getting Letty adjusted to what she called full access. She was conventional and conservative, so it took her some time to relax and accept everything I wanted to attempt. It was essential to overcome psychological hurdles. When we discussed our first success, she grew hoarse from the loud moans. After discovering that such experiences were possible, she ceased suppressing her sexuality. She never held back. Within six months, we had completed my entire wish list. When I acknowledged this to Letty, I tried everything I could think of. She, to my astonishment, asked me to push the bounds of our ability. I went back to Meadow and asked for assistance on how to achieve this. She conducted some research and provided me with a very thorough list of activities to try, half of them I'd never heard of. My Google search history would make even a promiscuous Frenchwoman blush. She also urged me to have Letty conduct her own study. I requested Letty to check for pornographic websites on the internet and email me links to tales she found interesting. So we came up with a list of 12 things to try. Meadow gave me good advice when she handed me her list, stating, Remember that what excites her, what she wants to do, and what she is ready to do are three different lists. Just because something gets her on does not imply that she wants to do it. And even if she truly wants to, that does not imply she will do it. Do you understand? Women frequently fantasize about different types of sex and other similar experiences. Very few of these women would even consider doing something like this. Just because something stimulates Letty does not imply she is drawn to it. If you decide to take this deep plunge, don't stare into the abyss, attempting to figure out what turns her on. Simply accept it and use it to delight her. I know Letty well enough to know that in the end, you are the only one she genuinely thinks about. You should be aware of this too. Later that week, I made Letty act things out. She was embarrassed by her reaction. She was scared I would mistake her for a promiscuous lady looking for sex with other men. I told her about Meadows' counsel and honestly stated that I had no plans to peer into the abyss, given what we had just experienced. It was difficult for her to accept, but she ultimately chose to trust me. Over time, I realized that I was not envious of this. As a result of using Meadows' list, she became much more open about what turned her on. We tried a variety of things that most couples would never try. We enjoyed the majority of it and discovered some pretty unexpected twists on what she finds appealing. One day, I decided that we would do something unusual for almost. I didn't like it at all, but Letty was thrilled. She was shivering from excitement. After that, she sprawled out on the bed, surprised, and asked, Where does it come from? I doubt you could find another woman who would like it as much. She wanted to make a joke, but when she did, her countenance turned thoughtful. She stated, I would never have done this without your desire. And see how I reacted. Do you comprehend what I was talking about in Meadow's office? I was able to enjoy myself without feeling guilty. I believe that today I justified myself. I agreed. It was an incredible year. Our sexuality has undergone a revival. Letty blossomed like the first flower of a lovely rose. In instances where she was often insecure, I frequently noticed her toying with the tattoo, deriving bravery and determination from it. Sexual experiments, servitude, and daily sex appealed to her for the first time since we met. She did not have a single failing week in the entire year. She became happier, less irritated, and significantly less anxious. She knew I liked everything and loved her, which boosted her self-esteem. For me, daily sex was simply heavenly. I walked like I owned the earth.
I walked on. Negotiation is an important aspect of my job at the gun shop. I stopped attempting to seem like P.A.'s stern businessman and became more easygoing when dealing with customers. I found that when customers see that I am negotiating in good faith and not trying to deceive them, they are more likely to agree to a decent bargain. The old aphorism is true. Confidence helps in negotiations. I was completely unstoppable at work. Our store was financially successful. I received three separate repurchase offers from other retailers in our area of the state. They were all lucrative, but I decided to stay in company for the sake of my staff. I kept all of the suggestions to myself, but somehow the knowledge got out. Anyway, J.D. Butler, the county commissioner, walked into my store one afternoon and said, Andy, I heard you turned down a buyout offer from J. Crown Tactical May Con. This is correct. I recognized that this was accurate and that it was a large sum of money, but I couldn't bring myself to agree. We adore this nation. Mr. Butler, I don't think I can even use a crowbar to remove Letty from here, he said. I have to admit that when I learned you went to college in Atlanta, I didn't expect you to return home. I figured you would. Into the wilds of Atlanta, as your brother and sister did. But you astonished us all by going home and firmly focusing on the district's future. I'm proud of you, son. That is why I wanted to speak with you openly about the future business arrangement. J.D. negotiated the purchase and redevelopment of the remaining businesses on the county's main street. The antique buildings on this street are wonderful brick constructions with large windows and wooden floors, evoking a bygone era of prosperity gritty with a little care. These structures will be wonderful a hundred years from now. Tyler, Jade's son and Sue chef at a three-star Michelin Bistro in Atlanta, is tired of city life, and his wife is expecting. He chose to come home to the county and build a farm-to-table restaurant. Tyler was hoping to capitalize on a trend that sees day-trippers from Augusta and Atlanta seeking a taste of country living. Lonnie, the proprietor of Lonnie's Barbecue, intends to relocate his restaurant two doors down from Tyler's and start a high-end coffee bakery and ice cream business with his niece. The family plans to transform an old supermarket into an old store, with everything priced at a cent or a dime. J.D. wanted me to relocate my business to the old Farmer's Bank building which was part of Uncle Kevin's store to display the rifles that won the West. J.D. believes this will provide something intriguing and rural for city folks to look at while they wait for their tables. At first, I was really skeptical. One advantage of a gun store is that we do not have to pay rent or mortgage on the building. However, deep down, I realize that the store's major vulnerability is its location in the middle of nowhere. I understand that if we were in the city center with better parking, we would attract more tourists. When Jacob showed me inside the ancient bank building, he convinced me of this concept. This is a stone edifice from a different era, which lends its stability. All of the store fittings are brass. The cash register is suitable for sales on the floor, and the massive storage container from the 1930s is still in fine working order. It can keep things with a low danger of theft. The county seized control of the bank due to non-payment of taxes. I may purchase the building for the amount owed in taxes. If I agree to operate a store in the building for 10 years, the tax will be 30% of the building's assessed value. I discussed it with Letty. My staff, siblings, and I discovered nothing wrong with it. My sister, who managed the family trust, let me borrow money early against her future portion of the trust. I purchased the bank building and relocated my store there. It was the smartest business move I've ever made. As part of what Meadow refers to as trust work, Letty and I have worked hard to be more honest and truthful with each other about what's going on in our brains and away from home. Every evening, we faced a succession of questions that forced us to divulge our secrets. Using this list, we learned to discuss what made us uncomfortable. I gave everyone the day off on Black Friday so that they could spend more time with their families for Thanksgiving. I was alone in the store when Florence Benson, an old school buddy, walked by to talk about school. Florence was an insecure, thin blonde who is renowned as a late bloomer. Florence was once his primary opponent for my affections as an adult. Florence transformed into the traditional lovely Kate Hudson, but with a nicer smile. It was a pleasure for us to communicate. She studied musical theater at Carnegie Mellon. Obviously, she matured in her first year and gained great achievement. 
She had just finished a 24-month run in the Broadway musical Wicked, first as a swing performer and then as Glenda as an understudy. She has got the role of Elphaba in the traveling show Wicked. She returned home for Thanksgiving to spend time with her family, knowing she wouldn't be able to see them for a while, when she embarked on tour. Around 40 p.m., I invited Florence to dinner with me and Letty. She respectfully declined, then astonished me by suggesting we have sex. She vowed to be careful and that no one in the vicinity would know. I'm ashamed to confess it, but I was quite tempted. Florence is intelligent, clever, and beautiful, and her adult physique is quite spectacular. Most significantly, her interest in me was quite flattering. She could have anyone. Her last boyfriend played outfield for the New York Yankees. I was the only person on earth who could pique her curiosity, and she would never forget me. It took all of my strength to gently decline. It helped that I knew in just a few hours I'd have to answer a question about whether I had been tempted that day. After Florence left, I shuttered the business, drove home, and promptly told Letty what had transpired. I expected wrath, envy, and frenzy to begin. Instead, she was overjoyed by my refusal and tried her hardest to persuade me that I had made the correct decision. This week, she completely drained me. She pushed hard to acquire that number to throw, but I was too tired. Letty was vicious and insatiable. Letty returned home four months later after a business trip to Atlanta. She looked over the ledgers, ever parted ways with the external auditors, and immediately stated that Wade Banks, an account manager for the external audit organization, approached her. Letty has known Wade for many years and considers him a good friend. She'd already mentioned him, and I knew everything about him. This is a very handsome man, a recent widower. Letty stated that after Wade's wife died, she tried to be a buddy to whom he could talk about his loss over dinner on his last trip. Wade expressed his love for her and requested if she would be the first woman to make love to him after his wife's death. She admitted with embarrassment that she was really tempted. What intrigued her? She recognized him as a nice person and sincerely wanted to help him heal and go on with his life. She stated it took a lot of willpower to say no, but I did. I knew that when I returned, I'd have to answer inquiries about whether I had been tempted. I wasn't going to lie about it, and it helped me say no. Following her lead, I chose to reward her for making the correct option rather than being jealous or irritated. I simply wore her down that week. The more. We practiced being open about difficult issues, and it grew easier. We've learned to fight temptation together, not individually. Learn to be honest. Dealing with the agony of her disagreement with Tig brought us closer than ever. I eventually sold my father's vintage ski boat to VK. One experience in June was enough to thoroughly hook him on it. After the third weekend, I advised him to simply leave the boat at home. I admit that the sight of my father's boat always made me melancholy, and it was a relief to get it out of my garage. When VK felt guilty about using it so frequently, he made a generous offer. I utilized that money to take Letty and I on our second Disney honeymoon. Letty has always wanted to go there. I'm not sure about the rest of the year, but for eight days in February, I can personally attest that this is the happiest place on earth. When our year came to an end, I was sad, but also grateful. We flew to Atlanta on our last night, and I treated her to a lovely restaurant, dressed in my best suit and tie. Letty wore her current little black dress with gorgeous red underwear. Underneath her new tiny black dress was more beautiful than the one she damaged by vomiting on it, while we were waiting for coffee and dessert following dinner. She went to the restroom when I returned. I tried my best to express to her what this year meant to me and how grateful I was to her for providing it to me. I had barely finished speaking when she placed her fingers on my lips, silencing me. I had officially accepted her explanation from the previous year. She stated to Andy, what you allowed yourself to do this year was the biggest bet of my life. You can be harsh and make me unhappy. You believe you were lucky, but I can honestly state that I won. My gamble paid off handsomely. She ran her index finger across her tattoo, just below the wording. Ride or perish. It now reads, forever. She clung to me, and I could smell peach pie. She asked, what would you like to bet now so that we can continue? Subscribe to our channels to ensure your second chaff does not cheat on you. Go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story pales in comparison to the following one.